We're starting out today with Frank uh, Doma, who is Mr. Trains, Planes, and Automobiles. He's written about autonomous vehicles and intelligent transportation systems. He's worked on uh, for the Canadian Pacific Railway, the Metropolitan uh, Airports Commission, and the Minnesota Department of Transportation. He's currently the Associate Director of the State and Local Policy Program at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Next, we'll hear from David Leonard, who's a journalist and artist. Um, he, uh, when he was a, a master's degree student at the University of California, Los Angeles, he used geolocation data along with other data to develop a tour technology for Fatal LA Tour, a multimedia uh, mixed data experience for Los Angeles. Before going to graduate school, he was a reporter whose stories appeared on ABC, CBS, CNN, and the Colbert Report. As a reporter, Mr. Leonard uh, reported disasters after the fact. Now he uses information and technology, such as murder rates and geolocation technology, not only in an aesthetic way, but as a way that encourages public engagement and discussion. Uh, we'll then hear from Vanu Thakaria, uh, a professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Professor Thakaria holds a PhD in public policy analysis, specializing in transportation planning, and a master's in urban planning from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And her work is at the intersection of transportation, society, and technology with an interest in how the, uh, what the potential is for technology to foster environmental, human, and economic sustainability. She's the co-author of the forthcoming book, Transportation and Information, Trends in Technology and Policy, and she's the incoming chair of transport at the University of Glasgow. Last, put it, pulling the panel all together, will be Richard Warner, who I've previously introduced as a professor of law at IIT, Chicago Kent College of Law, and the convener of this conference. Um, so we're going to go in the order, and uh, Frank is first, and we'll get his stuff up in a moment. All right. While we're uh, waiting for that, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Chicago Kent School of Law for the invitation to to be here. Um, it's uh, wonderful to uh, come back to Chicago. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to follow someone as uh, dynamic as uh, Mr. Claypool, because I know I'll never live up to that kind of a presentation, uh, but I'll uh, I'll do my best. And uh, and also, uh, uh, as you see, I am from Minnesota, and it, uh, you actually it's it's not that hard to say Senator Franken after you've gotten used to four years of actually saying. Governor Jesse the Body Ventura <laughs> with a straight face. So um, with that, uh, I'm not sure that establishes my credibility or anything like that. But uh, that's, how it, that's how we work when we have at least one day a year when it's 10 below. Um, also, uh, I was uh, pleased to see in the opening presentation by Professor Andrews that the uh, uh, state of Illinois has passed a law protecting uh, some of the IPASS data. And, and so forth. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was contacted by the general counsel for the Illinois uh, Toll Authority, um, stating this basic fact that uh, we're now getting freedom of information requests for uh, when uh, people's accounts have been pinged in various places from family law attorneys and so forth. We, we want to say no. Um, do you have any uh, research that might uh, help us think about that? Um, they, uh, the way the, author the authority is set up is that they can't say no without the state of Illinois agreeing. Uh, the upshot was the state of Illinois said, no, actually, this is something that if you have it, you have to share it. And uh, then the response was, uh, well, gee, we actually don't have that data anymore. It was more than six months old. Bye-bye. Um, so that's another way to, to handle uh, uh, some of this question. And I'll be talking specifically about some uh, transportation-related developments, particularly about transportation technology. Maybe I'm a little more Pollyannish. Maybe I'm just a glass-half-full type of person. But this could be some case, uh, a possible case study for uh, ways to think about um, balancing uh, the advance 
uh, advancements in technology that are complete that are so reliant upon uh, personal data uh, and, uh, and and being able to still get the benefits while protecting some of that privacy. So as I mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about ITS, intelligent transportation systems. Uh, why uh, are we concerned with uh, the benefits we could get from them? Uh, well, just talking about our highway system, it's not the greatest uh, uh, type of, uh, it, it's got problems, put it that way. Um, as uh, we heard earlier, um, there are more people dying on the highways each year than are dying in the wars overseas. Um, over six million crashes a year. It's the leading cause of death for uh, people up to age 35. Um, and uh, we are not moving as quickly as we should. In the meantime, um, billions of hours of travel delay that costs billions of dollars in terms of uh, things you could otherwise be doing while you're sitting in traffic. And uh, meanwhile, your car is burning fuel and spewing uh, noxious gases into the air, and that's not so good either. So. It was interesting, back in January, uh, I was involved in one of the, my first uh, uh, events related to self-driving cars and privacy and some of the legal issues in Santa Clara, uh, California. Uh, I came back home and my Wired magazine was waiting for me, announcing that um, not only is this something that we're discussing in academic circles, but indeed your next car will drive itself. And there will be no traffic jams. There will, be no be, there will be no crashes, <laughs> and you'll be able to text as much as you want. <laughs> and actually, uh, the, the first law allowing, officially allowing uh, self-driving vehicles to uh, exist in that state was in Nevada, and it has a specific provision stating that our ban on texting while driving does not apply to people in autonomous vehicles. California and Florida's laws do not go that far. So what kind of automation are we talking about here? Uh, well, if you, uh, this is back from 2000. Um, cars that we drove 10, 20 years before that, I think about the 1988 Dodge Omni that was my first car, kind of a dumb car, didn't give me a whole lot of assistance in how to drive, it did what I told it to. Um, and we're moving in the direction of the bottom here where the computer will actually ignore the human in the car. And uh, we will possibly have the opportunity, even though it's uh, not 2001 and it's not a spaceship, to have our own personal message of, I'm sorry, insert your name here, I can't do that. <laughs> More interesting to a legal um, uh, perspective is uh, this list uh, done somewhat differently by uh, uh, the German uh, Transportation Research Institute that points out that uh, we've gone from a driver-only situation where the human uh, handles the driving to different levels of automation. Uh, I get to the uh, partial automa automa automation point here where even though the system is able to handle uh, speed control, that's longitudinal control, and lateral control side to side, the driver is required to permanently monitor the, monitor the system and the human is indeed the fail safe and expected to make sure that the car is being operated in a safe manner. That's where we are today. The technology is moving to the point where the driver does not need to uh, permanently monitor the system and full automation where the system actually handles all the control at all times and this is actually something uh, where you could envision cars driving without humans in them. Uh, as a parent, that's the great idea that I can then send the car out to pick up the kids from school or soccer practice and I don't have to go get them. Now, what does this mean for privacy? Well, the cars, when we were talking about the dumb cars like my Dodge Omni, if I wanted to go somewhere and I didn't want to tell anybody about it, that was pretty much fine because the direction of where I was going and how I was going to get there was all up here in my mind. And I didn't have to share it if I didn't want to other than what people could see when I was on the road. Now that we're, doing, we're telling the car to get there, we're creating another set of data that is being stored in the car. And that is something that is not as easy to control. So we've heard a lot about the privacy law in the United States. I'll move somewhat quickly through this. 
We know the CATS test where there's an expectation of privacy that is deemed to be reasonable by society. Um, however, that uh, expectation is not reasonable in a private, or excuse me, in a public place uh, or in automobiles on the open road. I'll talk a bit about that more, uh, more about that in a minute. And the Kylo situation where uh, enhanced uh, surveillance technologies uh, cannot, uh, and cannot invade that, that, uh, that privacy zone. So uh, technology is somewhat limited uh, in terms of how much it, data it can collect by that case. Now, federal law, it sets a floor. And so when we're talking about transportation, we're talking about uh, US v. Knots, where uh, this is back in the dumb car era of uh, the late 70s, I believe. Uh, a person traveling an automobile on public thoroughfares has no reasonable expectation of privacy. And that's still basically uh, the law as it applies uh, to transportation. Um, uh, but there's been some, some modification of that. And state laws can indeed vary and build upon that. Um, recently, we've had a couple of cases. We've talked about the Jones case already. Um, also, uh, there was a couple of years before that, City of Ontario v. Kwan, which ended up being uh, decided on employment law uh, basis instead of on a privacy basis, because the question was the con uh, what was in question was the content of um, basically text messages, and the Supreme Court threw up its hands and said, we don't know what society's expectation regarding this technology is, so we can't decide on the CATS test, which uh, is somewhat similar to how things have, uh, transpired in the Jones case, where it was decided on the uh, trespass situation that a physical placement of the GPS on the car requires a warrant. Uh, still leaving the question of when the data is collected without some kind of physical uh, trespass, how much data can be collected and for how long. And uh, this is something that uh, some of the legislation that was referred to in the previous panel is starting to move forward uh, to address that. Now, the area I work, I'm not usually talking to legal audiences. I'm usually talking to transportation professionals who um, really enjoy it when I make lawyer jokes and really don't enjoy it when I talk very detailed about the law. So we created uh, what I call the ITS Privacy Toolbox, which kind of hinges on three points that they should keep in mind when developing these technologies. First of all, if they can operate it on data that is truly anonymous, that's best. Uh, and that's what they used to operate on all the time, uh, a loop detector embedded in the highway that can figure out uh, when to flip a, 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 a traffic control light, a, a red light signal, uh, to green or back to red, doesn't know who's in the car that put the pressure on uh, to uh, make the loop detector go. It's completely anonymous. Secondly, when you do need to collect data that's personally identifiable, do it in a way where you're getting consent. Uh, so at least uh, while uh, we're talking about uh, um, progressive insurance being kind of the brave, new, not so um, friendly world of collecting data and how about people and how they drive, at least people are making the decision to share that data. It's not being collected without their knowledge and without their consent. And then uh, examine what the question, how, who is collecting it and what are the limitations on the way they can use it and what limitations can they put on themselves to make sure that uh, they are using it in a way that uh, builds trust rather than erodes it. The uh, question that we've then been looking at is that of, well, all right, we've got these potential great benefits uh, from transportation technology of safer, faster, more convenient uh, travel uh, versus the fact that this is now being based upon uh, personally identifiable location information, or as we've started to call it, um, and I should give credit to uh, Dorothy Glancy at Santa Clara Law for helping us coin the term Pili, which you use with an Italian accent because it sounds so much more interesting. Um, but uh, we wanted to get into the question of is this really a black and white uh, question of um, privacy advocates versus uh, transportation advocates, or can you find some common ground? What constraints uh, can be put out there um, that allow things to move forward uh, before uh, public policy ends up um, 
actually being an obstacle to uh, achieving the benefits that could otherwise be realized. Um, so who's got a stake? We try to look at you know, who, who's involved in this question um, and how can we organize them in a way that's understandable. Um, one thing to remember in the transportation world is public-private partnerships are becoming a real buzzword so that you've got the private organizations working with the public organizations and that great distinction we heard about the Fourth Amendment applying only to government but not necessarily to the private sector becomes a real head scratcher here because you're getting the public and the private sector working very closely together. And so instead of trying to divide a by that kind of obvious uh, connection, we looked more at the functional roles of the, those who are involved. And those participants that we looked at were um, the ITS uh, developers, that was pretty easy. Uh, the users of the transportation system, that made sense too. Then we looked at government, and we realized government's got a whole lot of roles here. Um, we gave a, a specific category of government as a regulator here. Um, and regulator as well as facilitator of economic activity, so government trying to be the rule maker here. Uh, then also data collectors and users, which can include government, but also the private sector. And then the secondary users, those that would like to receive the data that is collected from this transportation, uh, these transportation applications to be able to uh, do advertising or uh, what have you. This is basically the you know, third market, third, third uh, party users. We put these uh, folks out in a schematic map and tried to map what their relationships are. All right, so everybody's involved with everybody. That didn't help. Uh, we unpacked it a little bit. You know, what, who's actually going to do most of the, inflict most of the privacy harms? Whose interest is in protecting the, the privacy? Um, who's interested in getting the benefits of this data, both upstream, who's collecting it, and downstream, who's, who's uh, getting the benefit from it being collected, and who's, who's setting the playing field. So we unpacked it a little bit more, and we got an even more complicated chart. However, there are some uh, lessons that can be pulled out of this. Uh, one thing is, that, is to notice that we don't have, as in the earlier chart, all arrows going to all different parties in all directions. Uh, there are some very uh, restrained relationships, such as uh, data collectors, secondary data users, um, really only have kind of an upstream relationship with, uh, with the ITS developers. Uh, you don't have to worry quite so much about um, some of the privacy issues uh, co coming up when you're talking about those. On the other hand, government has a very uh, complicated and intense relationship with just about all of these people. And uh, so that needs uh, some attention and things that need to be uh, unpacked. Now, um, <laughs> I just got the high sign here, so I'm going to have to blitz through this. Um, what I want to point out is, uh, one, we do unpack these in the article that uh, I have in the bio um, that will be coming out soon if you want to get into the details. But uh, let me give you just uh, uh, an example here of uh, how some of this is coming together. Uh, some tools for this time and the common ground are setting time limits for data retention, as we uh, heard about happening with the Illinois Toll Authority. But uh, I also want to highlight privacy by design, which is something that the industry is starting to uh, pick up on. Uh, traditionally, the idea is, I, has been that uh, the developer says, here's an application that has transportation benefits. Let's put it in the lab. Let's make it work. And then suddenly the uh, privacy advocates get back at us and say, well, you can't use that data, you can't use that data, and now we've got a battle on our hands. They start with the idea of we're going to develop our technology with uh, the idea of using as little data as we need for the most, most appropriate application. Uh, and that's uh, starting to become a, a practice within the industry. Uh, an example here, uh, then, it's the ITS uh, developers versus uh, drivers, uh, privacy by design coming forward there. Uh, another one is the transportation system operators, that would be like government uh, versus drivers. Again, uh, this is where uh, time limits uh, prohibiting secondary uses. You know, the legislature can always tell the state DOT, thou shalt not shall share your data or sell your data. And the, so the policy implications here is that we did find some common ground. Uh, in the ability to move forward with transportation benefits um, 
but it's on a sector industry specific scale. It's granular. There's not going any grand solution that we've been able to uh, identify in terms of being able to move this along. So there will be conflicts moving forward. For those practicing law, that's probably good news. There'll be opportunities to uh, litigate this out. But um, as we go forward, there is uh, some optimism I see that uh, we can uh, protect privacy while still getting the benefits of the technology. So uh, I could talk more, but uh, there's the contact information, and uh, we'll try to stay on schedule. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is David Leonard. I'd like to thank the uh, Chicago Kent uh, College of Law for having me. Lori, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really glad that these other speakers have uh, really freaked you out, hopefully, uh, and kind of primed you for um, you know, the technology uh, that, that's being used. Um, I work a little differently. Uh, I'm a data practitioner. Uh, almost an artist, uh, well, almost, you know, who knows. Um, so uh, I met Lori uh, at the Design Media Arts Department where I went to school. Now, that department uses a lot of the technology that you've been hearing about, face recognition, data mining, um, the, the whole slew of sophisticated things, even nanoscience, uh, not as a kind of a driver for products, but a driver uh, for uh, creative expression. So maybe in the past, uh, artists used paint, sculpture, other materials. Now we're looking at how the interface, how geolocative mobile devices can be used as a driver for uh, you know artistic expression. Uh, and that's pretty much what I want to talk about, but I want to also kind of get you in the mindset of uh, artistic geolocation and data practice. Um, if you'll go on a thought experiment with me, this is uh, from the start of a book on psychogeography, which I'll explain later. And this could be applied to Chicago as well as any other town you may live in. Unfold a street map of London, place a glass, rim down anywhere on the map, and draw around its edge. Pick up the map, go out into the city and walk the circle, keeping as close as you can to the curve. Record the experiences you go in whatever medium you fa favor, images, photograph, manuscript, tape. Catch the textual runoff of the streets, the graffiti, misspelled, sorry, the branded litter, the snatches of conversation. Log the data stream. Be alert to the happenstance of metaphors. Watch for visual ri uh, rhymes, coincidences, analogies, family resemblances, the change of moods of the street. Complete the circle and the rec record ends. Walking makes for content, footage for footage. Now, this uh, psychogeography was first developed uh, by the theorist Guy Debord, a uh, French theorist and leader of the Situationalist International. And he, 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 he was trying to examine this, this sort of uh, psychic or psychological uh, experience of moving through urban environments. Now, this is a map of Paris uh, where those lines uh, connect uh, different sort of island neighborhoods through this current of, of experience. He would also do things like uh, take a map of Amsterdam and use it as a guide for Paris. I mean, these all seem really absurd, right? But at the same time, he felt like he could unlock uh, some other experience not confined to the architectural and signage around him. Now, this is kind of an algorithmic uh, psychogeography where rules are applied to the way we move through space. Uh, people have been now using their GPS uh, as they walk to log their tracking uh, to create drawings and works of art. This was done by school kids in London. Um, recently, uh, Microsoft patented a technology uh, that uses uh, crime statistics, temperature, and other things to sort of drive you away from certain locations uh, where the crime exists or you know the temperature's bad, whatever. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my own practice a little bit. I was just married about a month and a half ago. And uh, I've always sort of, I don't know if any of you know Hans Morovic, the roboticist work, but he kind of postulated, you know, this, this day when we could 
kind of data dump our experience onto other people. And so I would in some way love to be able to do that the day I met my wife, you know, sort of express that, that feeling in Charleston, West Virginia when we met. Um, but anyways, uh, years later, we decided to get married, and I, I started logging the experience of planning a wedding, uh, which is <laughs> really, really stressful. Um, and so I kind of kept this analog diary uh, of how I was feeling. Some of them are cryptic. Um, and then I found an app to kind of help me make this more uh, kind of modular. Um, so T2 Mood Tracker actually alerts you throughout the day, giving you these um, surveys, you know, to kind of track your mood, how are you feeling anxious, uh, other emotions. So I did this over a period of time leading up to our wedding. And this is what some of the, the data looked like. And I, I started to think, like, how could I kind of create something that would, would, you know, like express what I was feeling? Uh, I looked at, you know, someone like, this is Nicholas Felton's report. I don't know if any of you know. He keeps an, he, he does an annual report of his life. And he creates, like, a chart of how, what books he's reading, the percentage of play versus work. And so... I looked at this and I thought maybe a chart or a graph, but it still didn't kind of say enough. And I started looking at the interface and I flipped it over and I started to know that it, it kind of looked like an EQ meter in a, um, in a, uh, you know, in a studio, a music studio. So I, I turned the data into a data uh, composition, a musical composition, and let's see if it, if it plays. Let's, let's just do this. And there it is. So that is the kind of sonification of my um, my. Uh, my wedding plans. Uh, uh, so I kind of wanted to do, show you that because I wanted to show you how data can be kind of shifted in different directions. You can represent it in all sorts of ways. And I also wanted to say how technology itself can be used in unintended kind of serendipitous ways. T2 Mood Tracker uh, was created by the same company that gives us Tactical Breather and Positive Activity Jackpot. Um, and so the company that brings us to that, this is the Department of Defense. And um, they use this for post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, soldiers who come back. And I just want to say at the outset, I am not comparing my data to the experience of war. So, um, but I'd be interested in kind of laying those data sets together because I'm sure they would reveal something interesting. Um, so they also use, uh, you know, the, the company that brings you this, uh, the wing is the National Center for Telehealth and Technology. And they've also been using uh, Second Life and virtual reality to show uh, PTSD uh, sufferers kind of reliving these experiences. This is a, a, a modeled space of an Afghani street. Um, so to kind of get both their moods and also explain, uh, educate them. So another one of their apps, which I'm really interested in, is, is BioZen. Now, BioZen is a meditative tool and EEG tracker, the brain waves that you were talking about earlier. And it uses a neurosky, which monitors the brain activity uh, to kind of give uh, feedback and charts. This is the Blue Brain Project out of, surveil uh, out of uh, Switzerland. And what it does is it, it maps uh, brain connections, neurological brain uh, connections in a rat. And they're trying to build this uh, for the human brain as well. Manuel Lima, who wrote the book uh, Visual Complexities, found uh, a similar uh, work of art that sort of made these connections, a Jackson Pollock painting, which, you know, shows the gesture, the physical gesture that Pollock made on the canvas. So each line represents his journey through space. Now, a lot of people who look at this, uh, you know, 
I don't like modern art. I get that a lot. I don't like abstraction. And I think it's just like data. You know, when you don't have a way of entering that space and understanding it, it doesn't yield a rich experience. Now, I had this experience. I'm an, a fourth generation Los Angeles native. So, um, you know, this is the crime report, the homicide report of everyone who's been uh, killed in Los Angeles since 2007, as recorded uh, by reporters at the time. They decided to uh, use the blog format to lay out all these murders where, in print, a lot of uh, marginal killings uh, were being uh, left off their pages. And so when I look at this, it doesn't really resonate that much. Um, and in the same way, Los Angeles has kind of a history of media. This is actually not recorded in Los Angeles, but this is the first simulated uh, shooting in film history, 1903, the great, great uh, train robbery. And you see that that representation continues in films today. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop, uh, Lethal Weapon, and the list goes on. Uh, this is a bit of a spoiler alert for uh, Falling Down. When Michael Douglas gets killed at the end of the movie, which is a tour through Los Angeles, um, he ends up uh, dying on the Venice uh, fishing canal. Now, I thought, what if we lay both his data and other data? And I felt like the same thing with the kind of chart thing. You don't feel it. It doesn't resonate. There's no, there's no connection to place. So I developed a tour called Fatalitour that connects both real and imagined uh, data on the streets of Los Angeles. So it's a tour driven by a mobile phone that connects to a database of now more than 3,000 murders, both real and imagined, on the streets of Los Angeles. It gives you information about the real shooting, uh, the age, et cetera, and also the imagined shooting. And it also uses uh, to connect to a hardware unit. I call this... Uh, an EED, uh, an empathetic explosive device. And um, I worked on this with Thane Morris, who uh, actually did the explosives on Die Hard. He won a, an Academy Award for his work on uh, The Natural, that last scene when they, the, the lights explode for those movie buffs. And he said, why uh, would you want to do this? And uh, I explained to him that I wanted to offer this other experience. And so while you're walking through the city, I offer these tours and also, uh, you know, collect this, this sort of physical residue. So you see in this map, this is uh, both drive-by shootings and officer-involved civilian shooting deaths, which are about equal in Los Angeles, with a shooting in Menace to Society in Compton and the shirt that was created driven by that data. And these are different shooting. This is Robert Kennedy. This is on Wilshire Boulevard. Um, this is in Chinatown. This is Michael Rodriguez, 23-year-old, uh, and El Evelyn Mulray from Chinatown. This is uh, Kane Lawson from uh, the Menace to Society films. And I'm also adding visual context. We talked about the Google goggles. I've had these for some time to create augmented reality experiences, also visual connections to the data where you can see uh, bodies as you go uh, walking down the street. And so in closing, you know, this, this map of experience that I'm interested in and I think, and, and also how our data can be driver for, for artistic purpose is, um, is something we have to consider. Not only how are we putting our data out there, but how Will, we, will our, rep, our data be represented, and how do we want to express it? So I want to thank you very much and end with a quote. The future is already here. It just isn't evenly distributed yet. Bye. I think the last speaker ended on a very nice note about the future, because you know, a lot of things we have discussed today are really creepy, frightening things about what's going on right now. And uh, there's a lot out there about how information technology and Im information and communication technology is going to become increasingly pervasive, ubiquitous, embedded. Um, so at that point, as we go get to that sort of ubiquitous information society, questions and expectations of privacy, well, what happens to them? I think these are very important questions, and I'm not quite sure 
the extent to which uh, the conversation has been had at, in, in, in the context of those, of those future scenarios. So my purpose is really um, to give an idea of the emerging transportation information infrastructure and the privacy challenges that arises as a result. Um, I want to talk about uh, the methods by means information is generated by means of which um, risks to privacy may be posed to uh, uh, citizens, as well as modes by means of which um, information may be gathered, as well as stakeholders. Um, the myriad groups of people and uh, government agencies and organizations that are involved. And the idea is there's a very complex interplay between uh, how these three uh, clumps, if you will, will uh, evolve over time so that um, you know, we are going to have resulting, I think, uh, differential trends in the way our privacy expectations are, are likely to be shaped in the future. So one of the, going back to the previous slide, I think we have had infrastructure-based ways of measuring traffic now for really 50, 60 years. I mean, the loop detectors that you see on the expressway systems in the Chicago metropolitan area were put in place in the 1960s, and we are sort of the pioneers of traffic management uh, technologies in, in a, you know, trying to understand where congestion spots are and so on. So, and you know, as we've seen with the different speakers speak today, over time, um, the methods by means of which data on location and transportation have changed, uh, are being gathered, have really changed over time. So that now we have enormous amounts of data. Uh, people have already talked about big data. Um, I will talk about it a little bit again. And to the idea that, you know, we are really removing human beings from the chain of control. I mean, we have this idea of machine-to-machine -machine communications and Internet of Things. Um, so, you know, where does privacy fit into all of that? The other aspect of it is that in, in contrast to in the old days, or even currently perhaps, where it, information on transportation and location used to be gathered by, you know, devices on the roads and in the, in the uh, train stations and highways, um, human beings, we are actively in the business of submitting information by means of which transportation information and location information can be created, and we need to discuss that a little bit. And uh, in terms of machine-to-machine -machine communication, well, as we have this enormous net network-centric sensors and large computing power, as I said earlier, the requirement for human intervention in the sense communicate control chain falls, and the need to have machines take over this long, complicated chains of information from generation to use um, uh, increases. So the idea of machine-to-machine -machine paradigm is where you have billions to trillions of everyday objects that uh, and the surrounding environment are connected and managed through a range of devices and communications networks. So now uh, you've heard about things like intelligent transportation systems, and actually there are many other examples that we have. In, a, in fact, transportation is a very... Uh, you know, a good example, I think, of machine-to-machine -machine communications because so much technology has already happened in transportation. Is transportation a very technology-oriented field? So, for example, a car is very smart. I mean, a car uh, currently has sensors all over. Um, it has sensors in its powertrain, in its chassis, in its body, and uh, there are so many recent motivations because of which uh, the car is becoming smart every day so that Whereas a smartphone definitely tracks you, the car is equally like able to track you. And it's a more powerful, has a higher amount of energy to track you over time than a smartphone can. So for example, um, some of the big drivers of um, technologies in smart cars are environmental sustainability. Okay, so onboard diagnostics and all those stuff you're very familiar with, you have it in your own cars. You know, how do you get the car to pollute less, you know, to be more energy efficient and so on. So energy efficiency and, you know, environmental friendliness has been a big motivator of making cars more smart. Um, another motivation, uh, probably the, one of the biggest motivations, is safety, of course. You already heard that it's the leading cause of death for uh, young people. Uh, last year, there were 32,000 deaths in the United States, down from 58,000 in 1973. <coughs> so that's huge numbers, a very powerful motivator. What do you say to that? If you know that the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration comes and tells you that if you remove the control 
of the car from the human being in the last few nanoseconds before there's imminent danger sensed by a car, you will save a life. So that's a very powerful motivation for making a car smart. So, uh, and of course there are other issues, equally pressing issues that are making the car smarter. Another issue is the extent to which we need to be friendly and think about our aging society. That's a very big motivator also of making the car uh, smarter because, I mean, that's a big thing with the motor companies right now, that how do you make the car more friendly to uh, be driven by senior citizens because you can't give everybody public transportation um, and, you know, uh, demand responsive type transport, specialized public transport is very, very expensive. So uh, to what extent and how long can you keep the person, um, you know, driving? So you may not agree with that or not, but anyway, these are the big motivators that are making the car smart. So now the privacy, where does privacy come into all of this? So, you know, if all the sensors, the LIDARs, the video image processing, the radar, uh, you know, all of this stuff that's, cal you know, b b getting information about you inside your car as you're driving, if it all stays inside the car, perhaps, you know, well, what about it? I mean, there's nothing great about that. But um, over time, we, are, we have the possibility, and in fact already have the possibility of connecting cars, your car, will uh, transmit information to the car behind you if it senses an ice patch so that before you can depress the brake so that you don't bump into the car in front of it, your car will do it automatically. So, you know, there's all this stuff that's going on. And a, um, a, the whole issue of connected infrastructure, vehicle to uh, infrastructure, which is called V2I, uh, and then connected energy, this is a big deal. For connected energy, the car, uh, transportation is one of the largest users of energy, obviously. So the whole idea of how do you connect electric cars to the smart grid so that you do load balancing to a more optimal degree than you can before. For example, your electric car will draw power from the grid and when the grid needs it, it takes back power from your car. So it's a two-way thing. So of course you might say, no, why I have a car because when my grandmother gets a stomachache, the car has to be ready with the power to be driven off. But you know, those are all kinks to be worked out. But the po po point is V2G is very much a de demonstrated deployed technology in many parts of Europe, for example. So we are getting to this situation where the transportation, your, your, what you're doing with your smartphone, what you're doing with your car is going to be connected to all these different domains like energy, weather management, emergency and crisis management, health management, and so on. And um, so as you already heard, I mean, the trends are obviously miniaturization, personalization, and the ubiquity of information. You, you know, things are becoming smaller. Information that's gathered about you is uh, personalized. There, and it's everywhere. And also in the transportation world, there's increasing connectivity between cars, in, uh, between persons, and the transportation infrastructure. So the flow of information is just explo explosive. Um, and um, now, in, in the other end, as I said before, in addition to machines, what generates information about transportation and gives away, so to speak, location are human beings. So it, the role of the human being in the transport world is actually a continuum. For example, you could have a totally autonomous vehicle where you really don't have any hin human intervention. Some of you may have heard about a car that was driven autonomously from uh, Italy to Shanghai. And as, as this one of the previous speakers says, you can now have autonomous vehicles in Nevada as well as um, in, in, in California. But of course, you have to have the human driver not filing their nails or whatever, actually in charge of trying to, you know, in, case, in the event that there is a need to have a human intervention. So it's not truly autonomous. I don't think they've gone that far as yet. But you can, you can totally eliminate um, a human uh, you know, intervention or human activity. But on the other hand, what you could do is you can also give power to people, and as has been the case, to be more involved in transportation decisions. This transportation decisions are made by huge, big, gigantic black box agencies, and you know, normal individuals don't have the potential to you know, tap into that world. What is happening with a lot of the social media type of technologies is that we are now being able to tap into that world and thereby being more involved and uh, enrich, uh, you know, have enriched decision making. 
So user-generated content really is about human beings submitting data through the internet, through mobile sensors, uh, smartphones, um, you know, the car, public transport, etc., and by wearable sensors. And in in terms of what is being generated, well. There are two modes by means of which you can generate content as a user in, in, in the mobility field. First of all, you could be a proactive submitter of information. That means you're volunteering information some way, or you're co-creating information in some other way. And you know, you could you could, for example, give idea. You could give um, you know, generate ideas. You could give feedback to a, a, um, transportation plans. You could help assist. Uh, in problem solving, you could do what is called human computation. For example, tasks that are necessary by transportation planning agencies that are very difficult for hum uh, machines to do autonomously. So you could, you could, for example, ask human beings to do that for you. For example, you know, you you could have like a huge database, for example, of you know. Uh, photographs of transit agencies around the Chicago metropolitan area, and your task might be, let's try to find a way of trying to designate which uh, transit stations are really in very bad condition. So, you know, I mean, machines will find it very difficult if you have really large amounts of data like that to try to understand subjectively what is being said by these pictures about the quality of the access conditions of the transit station, but it might be easier for a human being to do. So you can, use, you can use human beings that way. I mean, human beings could be involved in that way in, in mobility information. But, and then, of course, you have different ways of uh, sensing, such as submitting volunteered information through, let's say, open maps and, and, and all of that, or also opportunistic sensing by means of which you volunteer to be a part of, let's say, a fleet of cars, which allows the local agency to track uh, what the travel times have been because you have a GPS on board the car. Now, one of the big legal issues I, I, that, that, that's out there from what I've read, I'm not a lawyer, and you know, this is perhaps a good uh, conversation to have in the afternoon, is retroactive user-generated content. That the whole idea that if I tweet something like, you know, there is a, a, an accident at the corner of Madison and, uh, uh, I don't know, Jeff Jefferson and Adams, all right? I mean, somebody, I could potentially take that information and actually, the text-based information and create a database out of it that will tell the local transportation agency that there is an accident at that corner. So you can take this massive amounts of text-based information or video-based information, multimedia information that is submitted by users and try to create, um, scan that information from the web. It's called you know, some, one way of doing it is called web uh, scraping. I, I'm sure you've heard the term. Uh, it, so in those kind of contexts, there is a lot of information submitted by users. I mean, who owns that information? And if I write something, you know, that there's a, an accident at the corner of um, um, yeah, Adams and Jefferson, um, you know, I have some reasonable expectation of privacy. I mean, how, how can you use it for a secondary purpose without really, uh, you know, asking my permission? So these are some of the questions that come up. But the idea is, you know, the programs and initiatives relating to mobility and transportation are getting very wide. I won't go through the list here, but the whole idea is how do you connect everything to everything else so that there is this massive, f ubiquitous mobility information environment where there's flows of information between very different uh, entities and objects in our, in our urban spaces. And this leads to very big data and uh, has significant implications for sensor fusion and analytics. So the challenges to privacy, I think, in the future, when we have this kind of a situation where, you know, potentially everything, a lot of different things are going to be collected to a lot of different other things in many multiple different sectors, is that the, the sheer volume of the information, the fact that a lot of sensors and information are just going to be embedded. You won't know about it. It's ubiquitous. It'll be pervasive. It'll be everywhere. There's huge differences in the methods and modes of information production. And so, in my, in my mind, um, privacy risk and potential for privacy risk utility trade-offs exist at many of these nodes at each, you know, in, in a context like this. You could have, you know, privacy risks at many, many of these nodes. So how do you deal with, how do you even learn about it? How do you deal with it? Who are the people who are supposed to be involved in managing this? And then how do you even design privacy-enhancing technologies or privacy by design 
to, that addresses the needs of multiple nodes in this chain, and the organizational mechanisms that will be necessary in the connected world in the future. I mean, we talk about government being, um, you know, uh, the law being a part of it. Uh, we have talked about many different issues, but I think also in the future, you know, trust management and reputation management companies and so on uh, will play an increasingly larger role. And I think also, you know, the um, there's a need for improved digital literacy, understanding privacy implications of our actions. And I, it, to, to me, it's a little bit like you know, having even uh, carry, uh, introducing these principles and ideas and concepts even in school curriculum, really to try to explain to people what these issues are. Because I think there's a lot of lack of consumer awareness out there, and that's going to be increasingly a need to address uh, if we want to do this address this problem holistically. So that's my presentation. Thanks very much. Now, I stand between you and the chance to ask questions and lunch. I promise I'll be quick. Uh, so let's start with the title. The, the love is a bit of an exaggeration, but the, the title may be singularly appropriate after Vanu's talk. Uh, 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 what I'm really concerned about are trade-offs. Right, and uh, that's the usual thing that when I'm at privacy conferences, I'm usually one of the very few people talking about trade-offs. Now, Charlie Dunlop sounded that uh, note in his presentation. Yeah, turn that. I'm got too much volume, and uh, and almost every other speaker has sounded the same note. I'm going to be concerned about how we make the trade-offs, uh, and let's start with a picture of where we were and where we've been. I've I've wanted to use this picture of Michael Douglas forever. <laughs> uh, and this is my chance, right? But it's true, right? It's true. I love the, the satellite phone. It was really cool. Look at that, the guy on Wall Street. He has that really neat thing. And I want to talk about the red eye a little bit uh, to begin with, just for a little bit of background. And so I thought, well, who's looking at us? Right? Uh, <laughs> The presentations have laid out immense, the immense number of people looking at us. I just chose four out of, examples out of the thousands, right? These are the, are the geolocation coupons, the devices, Forrester, Gowalla, Shopkick, a whole bunch of those. This is from the thing for the, advert, the businesses that want to use them, innovative ways for brands to interact with local consumers. Yeah location-based ways to get you bu to buy. And some of them are very convenient, right? Uh, and there's the location-based gaming platform for mobile phones. Companies use all sorts of games to get you to purchase their product, right? And in the course of playing the game, you reveal information, some information including about where you are that they use for their marketing and also to present deals to you. Uh, now I'm, I'm back. I don't keep my location constant. So I have the tracker. Uh, uh, TripAdvisor I use. I travel a lot. TripAdvisor is a wonderful thing, right? You can be in Beijing and you open up TripAdvisor and you can see where the restaurants are, which would really help me if I spoke any Chinese. Um, and same thing in Gdansk, uh, you're going to see. And of course, they know where I am. Uh, and liquid space I've never used, but you know, it would be but these would be wonderfully helpful, but they also collect our data. And so here's my general picture of what's happening, right? Genie's way out of the bottle. We feed mountains of data, and it's truly mountains of data. It's measured in numbers that are incomprehensible, right? I've lost track terabytes, petabytes. Every time you look, the, there's a new expression for the amount of data we're feeding together. And it feeds into private businesses, government, and to the people that aggregated and sent it out. And our location data is part of that. Right? This, is the, this is what a very abstract picture of what's happening. And I have my quote that I always use that, that I love. Uh, we can determine where you work, how you spend your time, and with whom, and with 87% certainty where you'll be next Thursday at 5.35 PM. He wasn't kidding. Uh, so that's the picture. And our location data feeds into that. And so, since it is a conference on location data, and in particular since I chose the topic, I thought, well, 
what matters especially about location data, right? We got almost constant surveillance of almost everyone, almost everywhere now. So we add location data to the mix. Uh, we, we already have a lot to worry about. Why, what's the special thing about location data? And because of the increased power to control, right? I love the country, and you're 23.5% welcome here. <laughs> but it's not entirely a joke. <laughs> That's the, the point, yeah, it's funny, right? Except it's not entirely a joke. So greatly increased power to control, and you can see from the presentations, right? If you put the, all the presentations together, you can see the amount of data that they can collect from us Right, and, uh, and uh, used to analyze our wants and our desires and where, where we're moving. So, now, in a lot of the privacy conferences, not this one, interestingly enough, but a lot of the conferences, everybody wants to put the genie back in the bottle. And genie's not going back in the bottle. And one reason is we don't want the genie to go back in the bottle, right? right? Or as I put it better, we want to have our cake and eat it too, right? So having, right, went to have our cake. Oh, I couldn't actually figure out which one was the having and which one was the eating. Uh, but anyway, we want more control of our information than we currently have. I take it that's one thing that's clear. You look at all the surveys, right? Whatever you make of all the surveys, the ones, higher, the ones that the marketers and advertisers do, the ones that the privacy advocates do, they differ. <laughs> understandably, but they have one theme. They all show one thing, we want more control. They disagree about how much control, how we want to have it, and our particular attitudes, but it's overwhelming. We want more control than we got, right? But we also want all the benefits. As Vano was just saying, the enormous benefits, and Frank Duma, we want the enormous benefits, right? We get relevant, we get relevant information but, which is actually nice. So we get enormous amount of efficiency. Well, one of the things that impresses me, because I work a lot on the private business use of information, is the enormous amount of business efficiency that comes from this. We save billions and billions of dollars in all sorts of places, right? And as Vanna was saying, transportation, Frank was saying, transportation is one, but it's not the only example. Billions and billions of dollars to be saved, which could be used for all sorts of things, like professor's salaries, the first one that leaped to mind. Uh, and, we get, and we get sites for free. Right? We get sites for free, because, and this is my more business, not governmental focus. We get sites for free. Why do you get to go to Google for free? CNN Tech Republic is a site that I'm uh, off and on. WebMD Audacity is, you probably don't know, is a site that distributes free audio recording software. It's an open source software site for out of a sense of public service, promoting the common good presents free audio recording software. And the only way they can do that is collecting your data for advertising purposes. Right. Uh, and so we don't want the benefits to go away. Right? We want more control and we want the benefits. We want to have our cake and eat it too. And even if we wanted to, it's not going away. Even if we want to undo it, it's not going away. The other speakers, if you take all the complex information collecting infrastructure they described, they made the point. This is a point. This is a tiny little bit of the advertising infrastructure that lies behind the current web, right? The, the, the graphic, I would look for comprehensible graphic images for the presentations, I can't find one. But the point is, it's complicated, right? As the Facebook generation says, right? It, it, this infrastructure is not going away because people are making lots and lots and lots of money delivering to us the things we want. Uh, I don't see the, that genie's not going back in the bottle. So where do we stand now? Businesses are making tons of money. Governments are doing intense surveillance of us. I love Frank Dunlop's talk. I knew some of that from having read a book, amazing things the government is doing. But here's our business situation, right? Since we want to use the site, or as Bobak said, he wants his, I, his iPhone 5, right? We acquiesce in the information processing, even if we are uncomfortable with it, right? Who are you going to stop using Google? 
Well, okay, I'll use Bing, same thing. Okay. And no, so what can the businesses do? They can ignore the few of us that actually care, right? The few of us that actually care, the few privacy advocates, the few people that say, gee, I, just, I can't do this, they can just ignore them. They're making so much money off the rest of us. So what are our choices? Buy and submit, right? Or not buy. Buy and I big buy, go to the website and use it, right? And buy the products. We can buy and submit, use and submit, or not use and not submit. And almost everybody chooses use and submit, buy and submit. And so the sequence repeats, right? We're trapped. We're trapped in submission. That's our current situation. We want more control and we're trapped in submission. So the question is, how do we gain, regain control? That is the question. We want a better trade-off than we're getting. We're trapped in submission. We want a better trade-off, but we want to, don't want to give up the benefits. So how can we get more control and keep enough of the benefits that we're, to make us happy and enjoy all the advantages the speakers have, have indicated, including some, I'll call it art, including some, including some extremely innovative uh, and interesting art. How do we get the trade-off? And that, I'll ride my constant hobby horse through informational norms is my answer. Not primarily the law. Not, I, not primarily legal le regulation, although it certainly plays a role. Through informational norms. How am I doing? Okay, I'll finish up in about five minutes. All right. Social and informational norms are social norms that constrain the use, the collection, use, and distribution of information. And we've had them forever, right? When you walk into the wine store and you order some wine, they don't ask to see the report of your liver functions, right? Maybe they should, <laughs> but they don't ask. And you know that, right? And you know that they don't record whether you're there with a, a, a companion, let us say, or your spouse, right? They don't record. They don't currently record your clothing and behavior to determine your gender orientation, although that is relevant to your wine choices and relevant to marketing wine. And one of the cutting edge places of marketing wine is to orient it towards gender, gender orientation and sexual orientation. Right? But they don't do that yet, right? And you see my example, right? The, the, pharmacist, the pharmacist can't ask you if you're happy in your marriage, not unless the pharmacist is also your friend. Different roles concerning that we've had that forever, right? And they're, we've gone around this forever. They're what make our trade off between privacy and the uses of information, and they've done so for, well, I don't know, depends how, depends how you're willing to count. Centuries, 100 years, right? Trade offs may be good or bad, and they're not all good. The trade offs may be good or bad, right? But they're implemented primarily through our social coordination, not through legal regulation or legal enforcement. That's what we've been doing in the wine store. Same thing with students, right? There's some things I can ask students and some things I can't. Some things I can reveal about students and some things I can't. Some of that is now regulated, right? And what do they do? They make complex transactions easy. I don't have to negotiate with the wine store, right? Don't go into the wine store and say, well, what are your data collection practices? And in particular, will I need my liver report, right? I don't have to do any of that. I walk in the store, I already know. Right? Our current situation, in my view, and the view of my co-author, Robert Sloan, is we don't, one of the problems, we don't have the norms. Technology has advanced so rapidly, and you've just had it all displayed for you. It advances so rapidly that we're in a situation where we don't have norms. Well, we can't make the trade-off. We don't have the ready-made trade-off. We don't have... We don't have any trade-off except one. The one the businesses, or if you like to focus on the government, the government imposes on us. That's what we're getting. That's the one we're trapped into submission in. And so we need to create new norms. That's my, that's my mantra, right? We need to create new norms to which businesses conform. Now, you know, being an academic, I think I have the solution. Uh, <laughs> In our, forthcoming, in our forthcoming book, please buy, just email me and I'll send you the advanced copy order information. But here, it's not the solution that I'm so concerned. I think norms matter. That's as much of the solution as I'm going to argue. It's the question that I want to put forward. We've all called for trade-offs. How are we going to do it? 
And the lawyer's answer is legal regulation, right? And some of the, some of the other answers from the more uh, market-driven economy people are market forces. Well, the market forces have us trapped in submission. We've got to break out of that. How are we going to break out of that? Create norms that will then make our life with our smart cars and smartphones as easy as our life in the wine store buying wine. And indeed, how are we going to prevent the wine store from turning into the smart car? Because it's rapidly going that way. That's it. I would like to leave the rest of the time for questions and lunch. My, my question's not, it's really not a question, it's a comment. In terms of those that are privacy advocates, aren't we talking to the wrong group of people? I mean, don't we have to raise the consciousness of the public rather than the people sitting in this room if we're going to be able to help people understand where solutions could be or have an actual dialogue? I'm talking about the everyday people out there who don't think about this stuff at all. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I did mention this just very briefly towards the end of my presentation. I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of society progressing in general to this ubiquitous information society, as we call it, where information is everywhere. I mean, stuff is being collected all the time. And uh, this whole idea of consumer awareness and digital literacy, I think these issues need to be broadened because a lot of people don't know uh, what the issues are, where they're being tracked, or where information on them are being collected. There's, there's, there's just a, I mean, they're not thinking in these terms at all. Um, so I don't know at what stage or where we need to do it, but I think in um, you know, school education, it, it, could be, it, it could be a part of it. I mean, you know, uh, there has to be some kind of uh, forum in, in schools um, or in some other ways of education, ed educating the public about the, you know, the rights and responsibilities that come with having access to information and getting the benefits from it. Um, I, yeah, I'd like to agree with you on the education. I think it needs to go further. I think people don't understand how their computers and their smartphones work. They don't understand these technologies they're using. So how can they have an understanding of the implications of using it? It's, it's really a fundamental educational, it's not just if you get on there, it's gonna disseminate your information. It's like, well, this is how a computer works. This is the framework of the digital society that we're moving towards. You know, people know how to drive cars and they understand that there's an engine and they understand if they don't put gas in it, their car is gonna break down. I don't think uh, people even have that level of literacy when it comes to their computer and their data. So where do, where do you begin? Mm -hmm. There is a program that Common Sense Media runs um, and it's in thousands of schools, in elementary schools, a digital democracy program because they've had a couple of issues. Uh, some are with respect to privacy and teaching uh, people about that early on in their age, but also in cyberbullying. So it's, a, it's actually a pretty nice right. set of information yeah. where yeah. You know, they're getting more stuff yeah. uh, you know, than yes. we do here. But uh, Cory Doctorow has said something interesting about it, which is that we are we are training our children all wrong in this area. I showed some of the earlier, some of the web tracking technologies parents are using. So we're teaching student to, you know, kids to being used to being under surveillance, uh, where we should be teaching them, you know, how to understand, you know, what their devices do in terms of privacy invasion or things like that. And to, he said, we should be teaching people to, you know, hack out of the tracking at the public libraries and things like that. So it's a rethinking of the education for kids. Uh, for anybody on the panel or Professor Warner, uh, what you're talking about institute, uh, you're talking about coming up with norms that we can use to get a better trade-off with regard to the use of our information. 
how much can we do at this point, given the amount of information that's already out there and has sort of a life of its own through various po privacy policies and things like that you've already signed on to? Well, I, I, I'll give you two, two answers to that. And my personal one is and not much. It's probably all over. But then I'm, I'm, I tend towards pessimism. Uh, but, uh, but that's not a terribly interesting answer. So what Bob and I propose in, in our book picks up on the educational theme that, that people have stressed. And all right, is you, you will, since we have some market conditions we're trapped into, you will need regulation to break that. And the and, but the goal of the regulation should then be to create a, a norm that functions apart from the regulation. And to do that, you will need to appropriately educate people to the point where they understand why they should conform to the norm. They understand they need to put gas in the engine and so on. But I, and on that point, and then I'll stop us, uh, but I want to underscore the, the limits. Uh, the ultimate goal is not to have us have to understand a whole lot. My ultimate goal is to have us understand as much as we understand about our water heaters, right? which is basically nothing. Uh, they, they heat the water, they die every 10 or 15 years or so on, and, and, uh, and there are differences in efficiencies, and so you sort of have to be careful when you pick one. We need that level, but to get there, I think we'll have to have much more education, uh, and as Vanu says, put it, put it into the schools. I also want to jump in and say I think also it, it's the you need to have uh, dialogue, increased dialogue among the decision makers and the thought leaders on these areas because as we've seen in, in transportation, privacy wasn't something that was really on the forefront right. of the people who were pushing the right. transportation technology. Once you got their attention, they realized that there might even be a market advantage for them to be uh, making technologies that are much more efficient in the data they handle and they're not collecting a whole bunch of uh, location information beyond the, the basic necessities, and they're being more open about how it's being done, and they're designing it from the beginning. So uh, the more the discussion can happen among those who are at the forefront of the techno technological discussion, the more likely it's going to get credibility, um, uh, I think, uh, on the high levels as well as uh, necessarily from the uh, grassroots. Do you, this is for anybody on the panel. In terms of the education, I, I appreciate the, the negative that we need to do. In other words, tell people about the risk. But shouldn't we also emphasize the affirmative in terms of the value of keeping your ideas to yourself or to a group that you control until you're ready for the public to have them? And in terms of, uh, in other words, we, we have to work that through with young people because I don't think that they see that. I think they, they've gotten this idea that the more you put out there, the better off it is for them personally. So I think that we have to change that conversation. But in terms of information that's already out there, what do you think about the idea of identity replacement? In other words, we have bankruptcy proceedings now. In the future, it, you know, you don't change, the, you can't change the fact that things were happened out, but you can have a process possibly I haven't thought it through, where you completely replace your identity. And as a matter of law, nothing before this date can be used or, or whatever. What, what do you think about those kinds of solutions? I'd, I'd like to answer the first one, and then someone else can deal with that second one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in terms of uh, just being out there and using open source software and, uh, you know, also delivering it to clients, and, and I think that's kind of what you're talking about, people just sort of putting their ideas out there, beta tests or whatever. I, I don't see that there's a, um, a very clear business model for like these sort of micro transactions. Uh, so, so me as an individual, I have to wait, what, 10 years before I start to kind of like work my idea in, in because I can't, get, you know, I can't get a patent because I can't afford a patent. You know, it's uh, sometimes it's better. You're better off, I believe, in this day and age, uh, externalizing your work because it'll move forward quicker and faster. Also, by putting together um, agile groups uh, and making small agreements, um, 
you know, I've seen iPhone apps where two people, you know, can kind of hit on some sort of contract between uh, distances. I don't know how, how you would, uh, you know, work this in a legal framework. I'm not a lawyer, but I do believe that um, this idea of secrecy and holding, if it's a good idea um, and it belongs in eventually in the public domain, why hoard a good idea? I think the cream rises to the top. I think the old model of like, you know, what we see with Apple and Samsung fighting over a, um, over a rectangle is really disturbing. And I think ultimately, that's what I worry about is that we won't get to Mars because, you know, or a cure for cancer or all these things because someone is deciding to sort of lock it up. I'd rather have a cure. Well, I, I guess that that is really one of the central issues that we have to grapple with because how do you incentivize people? Human beings need incentives to, to and part of that is the reward system, and it's not just about owning the idea and, and getting the money. It's the fame and the credit and everything else. To, if everybody knows if they put an idea out there, then it belongs to everybody, then what is the incentive to focus your efforts to be the best you can? And I, I'm reading through Steve, the biography of Steve Jobs, and I don't think we would have had Apple if it wasn't for the fact that he, you know, he spent a lot of time working through his incentives, not giving it to everybody and so forth. So can you really advance society if, if you take away those incentives, which some people look at as selfish, some people would look at it as a recognition of the human condition? Do I'll try. <laughs> uh, but just briefly, I agree with you. If, you, if you're going to live in a, market, in a market economy, which we are, right, then you're going to have to respect market incentives. The, otherwise, things won't work properly. And I actually spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how to, make, how to structure the incentives in a, an appropriate way. But you run into a brand new area where all sorts of communication and cooperation is possible. And what I don't, I don't think we know is how to get the maximum benefit out of that. And I don't think we know what market incentives we want to keep, right? We have to, we have, we have to keep some or junk the market. And, and we learned, you know, about 14 years ago now that from the demise of the Soviet Union, I do a lot of work in Poland. It's really not a good idea to junk the market. Uh, so I don't, think we, I don't think we know. So to you let me ride my hobby horse again, that's why I emphasize norms, or if you like, Christina Neppert Ng, who's actually a sociologist here in our faculty, has written a wonderful book called Islands of Privacy. And what I think your young students, you know, we talked about this before the conference started, your young students don't have, an, aren't adept enough, adept enough at creating islands of privacy and don't know where they need to create them, right? And so this is something, a kind of consciousness they almost certainly need. If I can jump in on the, your second uh, question. Um, I agree with your answer on to the first one. Um, I, I go uh, back to uh, what we heard from uh, Teddy Claypool talking about Europe and the fundamental human right to privacy. Um, they uh, have put out there sort of a corollary or a similar idea of the right to be forgotten. That uh, not necessarily that everything uh, gets dumped and you can be, uh, you can uh, shake the etch a sketch and start over, but uh, that, um, that, cert that that certain amounts of certain kinds of data, certain amounts of data can only be retained for so long for any reason, and after that it goes away and it can't be dredged up. Um, and I think that uh, is uh, probably one of the most interesting and probably important advances to be able to uh, allow us to go forward. I have another question that um, related to the um, Jones, I think it's the Jones case. I think that's the one, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But the, uh, where, where the ruling was primarily based on a trespass theory. Um, and the comment, there was later a comment on um, uh, Scalia seeing privacy kind of as a property right. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, with, like not all property is physical. Um, 
some property is intellectual. So if, if say, for example, you, you know, because there was a device put on the, the car, a physical device, um, and, that, uh, and that was the linchpin for that case, if there's technology that doesn't require a physical device to do the same thing, couldn't the analogy be made um, from an intellectual property perspective that, um, well, if privacy is a form of almost intellectual property, so too would be the device that could track it without a physical presence, and therefore the, the ruling could still stand, withstand, even though there isn't a tracking device that's physical that you could pick up in your hands? Um, I, I think that argument could be made. It has not been adopted by the Supreme Court, uh, so and and it, and so it, it's not the, not the law. I w I, so I wouldn't rely on that as being a a, a way to, to behave. Um, but I think that uh, and is, is is Teddy is Mr. Claypool still here? Or no. He oh, okay. He would be the one best to answer the, that question. But I think probably the reason why Scalia carried the day. Uh, on Jones uh, for that and being able to write for uh, the majority was uh, uh, on two counts. One, it didn't uh, necessarily have to make a decision about the reasonable expectation of privacy versus technology, but uh, two, he probably is trying to lay the foundation to move in that direction. But uh, and he's still got to get uh, at least four other justices to come on board uh, before he retires. <laughs>